we are going to be joined by, joined by Dr. Alon Burstein shortly. We are getting uh, situated here. We're, we're trying to wrap our heads around where exactly this may be located. Uh, we are hearing from the Associated Press that this is a camera that's situated by Kuwaiti Hospital. So what's interesting about this image is we've been staring at this exact live camera night in and night out, and we have not seen smoke billowing from this area before. Uh, we have another Gaza camera, and so this camera is situated in southern Israel, and it's pointed toward southern Gaza. You see a little bit of the smoky uh, atmosphere. We were checking in on this camera within the last few minutes, and we didn't really see so much smoke. I I'm not sure if the cameraman perhaps panned to a different part of the area out there, but we are certainly seeing some dark clouds emanating from this area as well. We, of course, cannot confirm if it's the exact same dark clouds in this picture that we're seeing. We work in real time here, and, and a lot of times reliable information is tough to get in the immediate moments after some sort of possible military activity happens. So we have Dr. Alone Burstein standing by, and Alone, we thank you for coming in and joining us because uh, we do seem to connect whenever there's something breaking going on, especially as of late. I want to ask you straight up, so let's just put this on the screen. I want to make sure that we got it up in full. Your initial assessment, when you look at this picture, um, does it appear that this is somewhere in Rafa to you? Yeah, uh, good to see you, as I always say, although, yes, it does seem that we're always connecting in... Uh, Times of war. Um, yes, I am fairly certain that what we're looking at is Rafah. I can see it also from the sign there. And in general, there's a few hospitals that are termed the Kuwaiti Hospital. Usually what that means, different hospitals in the Gaza Strip are of a term, the Kuwaiti Hospital in, um, in Han Yunus is a European hospital. That just means the government that sponsored it. Um, but it would make sense that this would be the Kuwaiti Hospital in Rafah. There's a hospital, its official name is the Yusuf Najah Hospital. And it is right on the area that the IDF has ordered the evacuation of when before it started carrying out its invasion on May 7th. So if we remember when it already like about four or five months ago, the IDF out of critique that was coming from the United States that it cannot just order the evacuation of an entire area like it did in Northern Gaza where a million people all of a sudden had to evacuate. The IDF really broke up a map of the Gaza Strip into well over 100 or 200 much smaller zones, neighborhoods, and which would now order people when it was invading Han Yunus, for example, leave these three neighborhoods, the Al Amal Haz neighborhood, leave that now. And, and an hour later or two, several hours later, there'd be an invasion. That's what happened in, in southeastern Rafah. There was a call specifically for people to leave those zones. And we're seeing the streets here are practically evacuated. There's some people we're seeing down in the bottom right corner of the street of the screen, but mostly the area has been evacuated. And then the IDF pushed in. The Yusuf and Najah Hospital is right there, and it is known also as the Kuwaiti Hospital. So likely we're seeing airstrikes and fighting in this region. What makes you think that this is an airstrike? Is it because this is located in a more central area of Rafa? Um, honestly, the pattern of smoke, um, like it, it does not look like tank battles that would um, th that would ensue, uh, you'd see several different patterns of smoke. Could be artillery fire, but this looks like one strike. Like there's one center of dark cloud in the middle and then it's slowly disseminating above. I mean, I'm not uh, an analyst of you know military pictures. This is unfortunately just a result of looking at the war so intensely for the last seven months that I've started to see the difference between airstrikes and you know tank battles. So I would wager this is not an ongoing battle necessarily, but rather a bombardment. It could be an artillery bombardment or it could be an airstrike. It's also important to note that the IDF, at least according to what was reported, and when I saw you have these images up, I was quickly scrolling through the different uh, news sites of the IDF to see if anything new has been reported. Um, th there's not supposed to be, at least right now, an ongoing advancement. There is IDF activity in this region of southeastern uh, Rafah. But there's not supposed to be advances, certainly not with the hovering threat of President Biden, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon. Um, chances are we're not seeing the idea of push further into the city. So very likely this is more an airstrike that was carried out, which is constantly carried out. And Rafah has in other places that is carried out in the heart of the city, but not an advancement. Again, that's a guess. That's my guess for now. 
And unfortunately, during these breaking news moments, sometimes all we can do is make educated guesses about what we're seeing in real time. I, I gotta ask, we've been watching for the past week or so as the IDF has uh, creeped in on the ground through eastern Rafa. Where exactly would this be located? What would you describe this as? What part of Rafa is this in that we're staring at? So this is close to the border with Egypt. If the camera were to theoretically turn around to the left about 90 degrees and go very high up, we would probably see the border with Egypt about a mile or two away. When we say that the IDF went in from the southeastern parts, what we really mean is going from Israel, from the area of Hanunis, the, the, the border uh, point between Israel, Egypt, and the Gaza Strip. Right, there's like a, a triple point where they connect. The IDF really pushed up through that area, going almost along the Egyptian border. So the idea was really to try to almost bypass the heart of the city, which is what we're seeing. Let's say the camera were to hover up. So we would be looking out now directly into Rafah, sort of like across the city. But what, where we are now is much closer to the border, which is really where the IDF had pushed through. I would imagine, again, this is speculation from my knowledge of the city, I would, Im uh, I would imagine that the IDF in its invasion probably invaded somewhere about two or three miles to the east of where the camera is right now, like along the border going back. And I'm also imagining that because I'm not seeing where this is here. I'm not seeing any damage from actual battles. So the IDF invaded the southeastern parts of Rafah in the last several days. We do see in the, on the right-hand side of the screen a building that has been damaged from a bombing. But there's no, again, if I describe a war zone, there's very little bullet holes, there's very little tank shells. The building that's right in front of us on the left, we see some scarring there from possibly gun, a, a gun battle at some point. But this does not look like an area that the IDF swept through itself. I think it swept through from behind this area going along the border. So I should make it uh, obvious that we don't have a direct connection with the photographer on the ground. I wish we could pan around and, and see a little bit more of the area. That is an Associated Press camera that we're getting that feed from alone. Let's move it on because we do have a lot to cover, uh, especially as it relates to a lot of the complicated matters relating to this war. Let's talk about the UN. The United Nations says more than 80,000 people have fled Rafah since Monday, as Israel's military has said its ground forces are conducting targeted activity in eastern Rafah, as, as we've been talking about. This picture that you're looking at is from the UN. I'm curious, alone, why is the IDF targeting these specific regions? Have we heard of terrorists being eliminated within these neighborhoods so far? We have. There have been gun battles. The IDF is reporting that there has been at least, uh, I think the latest report was 50 to 60 uh, Hamas terrorists that have been killed in the operations. That is far from the heart of Hamas territory in Rafah. Those are just people who were armed likely Hamas operatives or Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives killed in gun battles with the IDF. This is a strategic point that the IDF tried to go to. It's a tactical zone to control. By the, fa by the fact that the IDF now controls the Rafah crossing, it does several things. First of all, the IDF now has concrete boots on the ground control over every single access point to the Gaza Strip, while the IDF has retained overarching control of the situation since the war began. For example, it, it informed Egypt that aid trucks cannot cross over from Rafah into the Gaza Strip directly. However, Egypt at one point threatened that they would start letting aid trucks crossing in without being inspected by the IDF. Now the IDF has official control on the ground. Nothing can come in or out of the Gaza Strip. There is no access point, land, sea, or air, that is not controlled by the IDF. So from a tactical standpoint, this was very important. In addition to that, I would argue there is probably symbolic importance to this, both for the Israeli government and the Israeli government trying to send a message to Hamas. For the Israeli, from, the, from Israel's point of view, by taking over the Rafah crossing, that is really one of the symbols of Hamas's control in the Gaza Strip. When Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in 2007, one of the things that it did very, very publicly is take over the Rafah crossing, execute the Palestinian Authority people who were the security officials there and place its own members there. Now they have been ousted. It is one of the symbols that say, you do not control your territory. You are no longer the government. At the same time, in Israel, right, there is this 
very, very fragile coalition between very hawkish elements on the one hand that are calling to go in and reoccupy Rafah and damn be the consequences and are also openly saying damn be the United States. And then there are other elements like Benny Gantz's party that are certainly not dovish, but they are more moderate. And they are saying, no, you have to be strategic. I think what Israel's trying to do here is a message internally is saying, look, we are operating in Rafah. We are not being held back. We are going ahead and taking over very, very important tactical locations, at the same time, not actually carrying out the invasion that the United States has said do not carry out yet. So there, there's a little more I want to touch on. The United States is again, uh, and, and let's make sure we bring up this tweet here, the United States is again warning Israel against expanding its operation into an all-out assault on Rafah, this time not only for the long-held humanitarian concerns, but also for strategic calculations as well. U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said today that any kind of major Rafah ground operation would actually strengthen Hamas's hand at the negotiating table, not Israel's. Alone, wh what is the U.S.'s rationale behind why that would help out Hamas more than Israel? The only thing I can make of that is diplomatically. Rafah has become a symbol. It's become a symbol. It didn't have to be. It's one of these things that ended up becoming a symbol as a result of the fact that it was the last stronghold of Hamas, but also the place where most of the world's attention is focused. It's where most of the Palestinian internally displaced people in Gaza are. It's where UNRWA is located, where mostly humanitarian aid is located. And where Israel was saying quite openly, it intends to go in no matter what, without first presenting to the United States or to the world a plan for what's going to happen with the civilian population there. With this, it was the first moment in the war that the United States really put the brakes on Israel. The United States told Israel to stop its massive bombing campaign from the sky in December, January. That was the first time. And the second time is when it told Israel, you cannot just invade Rafah. With the United States doing that, that, is so, that was seen in the world as, okay, there is something really wrong with Israel invading Rafah, right? Until now, the world has been condemning Israel a lot, but the United States usually supports Israel. With the United States saying, put a break on that. So that led to Rafah becoming a symbol. What I, can make, what I can make of this tweet, the idea that this would strengthen Hamas is certainly not militarily. Hamas is not going to be stronger militarily if the IDF invades Rafah. However, if the IDF invades Rafah, it is very, very likely that the world condemnation of Israel is going to increase to levels we haven't seen yet. I would wager that if the IDF carries out a full-out invasion without U.S. support, we may even see the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, adhering to a call by South Africa and issuing a direct injunction against Israel that it is compelled to stop the war now. Those things are going to massively strengthen Hamas. I, I imagine that that is what the United States is referring to rather than sinking militarily. Hamas has proven to be very strong. It's also proven, though, that it has not managed to stop the IDF from invading the northern parts of the Gaza Strip or Hanunis. So it's unlikely to be strengthened militarily, but diplomatically, if Israel, for example, was ordered by the ICJ, or if Russia gets involved in the Security Council and starts carrying out more actions against Israel, something like that, that is going to strengthen Hamas significantly. Let's talk about what you alluded to earlier with President Biden. Uh, Biden said Wednesday that he would not supply offensive weapons that Israel could use to launch an all-out assault on Rafah over concern for the well-being of the civilians that are sheltering there. There's been a lot of chatter about this since yesterday, but let's, let's clarify something. This did not bring a complete end to all weapons. Is that correct? Absolutely. There's, first of all, a clear distinction was drawn by the administration saying that any weapons that are used for defensive capabilities, such as Iron Dome, which is by definition defensive. One of the things about Iron Dome that I think was done very intelligently by the developers, it cannot technically be used as an offensive weapon. So that makes it, it almost takes it out of the equation of being seen, unlike, for example, some air defenses that can also be used to, for, for attack purposes. Iron Dome technically almost cannot. So Iron Dome specifically was named by President Biden as something that is still going to be supplied and funded. In addition, the president also said in his CNN interview where this came out that it would continue to supply Israel with any defensive and other weapons that it needs for long-term, sorry, for long-range defenses. So not to hurt any of the capabilities vis-a-vis -vis Iran. What this means right now is a threat to stop Israel and get it to, get it to think, to say, 
we're not holding back weapons yet. There's one shipment of weapons that has been held up. However, this is not a weapons embargo. The United States has not said it's going, it is stopping the weapons from being sent to Israel. It says if, this constantly says if the Israel carries out a full-out offensive against Rafah, then this will happen. Again, it's just a way to try to tell Israel, take the United, Stra the United States seriously. The fact that the U.S. administration is not in favor of this, and we've seen this rhetoric escalate. We've seen the United States at first say that they would like to first see a plan. Then we've seen the United States say that they are not convinced by Israel's plan. Then we saw Secretary of State Blinken say that it is possible that Israel will not even need to carry out a Rafah invasion. Now we're seeing the United States saying a Rafah invasion is actually counterproductive and will strengthen Hamas. We're seeing a constant escalation in rhetoric, and this is really an open threat. But it's a threat to try to say we're not holding weapons yet, but we could take us seriously. The weapons have not been halted yet, but it's a way of saying that the United States is not just playing a war of words. It is actually serious in its threat. According to reports from the Wall Street Journal, um, and I think it was picked up by Reuters as well, the United States did not want to make this public. This was already a weapons shipment that was being held up by the United States in anticipation of what Israel was going to do in Rafah. And it was only made public after in Israel it was made public that the United States is holding up a shipment, so Biden was asked about this in an interview, and then it came out. But the plan in the United States was not to try to make this something that the world sees that the United States is holding Israel, but rather to quietly try to get the Israeli government to adhere to what the U.S. administration would like to see. I'll add one more thing. You asked, does um, have all weapons supplies stop? Not only that, Israel has enough weapons to carry out the Rafa invasion. Israel's been very clear about that, and the way armaments work, Israel could still carry out the Rafah invasion. The United States does not have the capability to tell Israel, we're not giving you guns in order to carry out this invasion now, so you can't carry out this invasion. But Israel would not carry out the invasion because it is going to need resupply. That is one of the things we've seen in the war. Every time Israel carried out a major offensive, like in the first two months in northern Gaza, it constantly needed to be resupplied. That is one of the reasons that the Biden administration is saying not we are halting your weapons now so that you can't do it is saying don't do it you're going to be in trouble after if you carry that out before we go i want to head up north this was posted within the past three or four hours uh this is showing idf fighter jets striking terror infrastructure belonging to hezbollah and southern lebanese towns there's been so much going on in gaza alone that, that some of this is flying under the radar uh, as you and i have discussed offline what's been happening lately between the idf and hezbollah so it's very important to actually link this to what is happening in Rafah and what is happening with the relationship between Israel and the United States. The situation between Israel and Hezbollah has escalated in the last week after it went through a period of more calm. Now, more calm means only several rockets per day fired by Hezbollah and only several IDF actions carried out in Lebanon. And that period of calm really was almost a result of the escalation between Israel and Iran. When there was the escalation between Israel and Iran, happened a month ago. The situation between Israel and Hezbollah simply calmed down. Hezbollah is the, the most direct arm of Iran. So while there was escalation with Iran, Hezbollah was sort of taking a step back, rearming itself, etc. In the last weeks, we have seen a substantial escalation. And a couple of, for a couple of days, there were over the barrages over 100 rockets and missiles and drones that were fired by Hezbollah. Yesterday, Hezbollah sent six suicide drones into Israel. In the last few days, several IDF soldiers were killed. At the same time, the IDF has been carrying out substantial attacks throughout southern Lebanon. All this is going on, meanwhile, like alongside the war, as if it's disconnected. But it's important to remember two avenues that is connected inherently to what's going on in Gaza. One, the situation right now in the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, are not sustainable for both countries. Which means that even if, for whatever reason, all of a sudden, the war in Gaza is over. Israel's compelled into a ceasefire. Israel agrees to ceasefire. Hamas decides that it is evaporating and leaves. The situation between Israel and Hezbollah is still there ready to flare up. There are still 100,000 civilians, give or take, on both sides of the border that have evacuated. And that is likely, after the situation in Gaza is resolved, is likely to turn into, into its own war. And at the same time, if a um, shorter term ceasefire and truce is worked out in the Gaza Strip, the situation up north is going to be critical because if Israel still continues to fire at Hezbollah, 
Hamas may say you're violating the truce as far as we're concerned. Hezbollah came to Hamas's aid. Hamas may end up coming to Hezbollah's aid. So there's a very, very close link between the sides. And the last thing I'll say, also again, Israel's armaments in Lebanon. If Israel, if that does deteriorate to a much larger war, Hezbollah is much stronger than Hamas is. Hezbollah has more missiles. Hezbollah has more trained troops. Hezbollah, unlike Hamas, is also not engulfed in the Gaza Strip and held by Israel. It can be resupplied through Syria. Israel's going to need a lot of armaments and a lot of support from the United States. And I would wager when the war cabinet in Israel is meeting and thinking, can we withstand the United States starting to cut down the offensive weapons supply? They're not only thinking of Rafah. They're thinking of what's going on up north and the escalations that may happen there as we get closer to summer. So as we learn more information about this, I'll remind our viewers that our Orlando crew will pick up the coverage at 6 o'clock Eastern time in the morning. Hopefully by then we will have a little more context about what exactly we're staring at on this Rafa camera. We're going to leave it there for now alone. Good to see you. As always, we look forward to watching your daily YouTube uploads as well. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night.